You are listening to the SDSU Football Podcast, presented by the East Village Times with your hosts, Andre Hagverdian and Paul Garrison. Welcome, listeners, to another episode of the SDSU Football Podcast. I am your host, Andre Hagverdian, and joined, as always, by Paul Garrison. Today is the day of the opening, the soft opening of Snapdragon Stadium with the fall scrimmage for San Diego State. So all of you out there that will be attending, I think you guys are in for a treat. I got a sneak peek uh, of Snapdragon Stadium on Friday afternoon as part of a media tour, and it's amazing. Later on in this episode, uh, Paul and I kind of talk about the stadium, and I give some of my thoughts on what I saw during the tour, what the cool things uh, about, you know, what makes Snapdragon Stadium unique. So make sure to stay tuned for that. First up, though, we have an interview with NFL tight end and and Aztec for Life, Daniel Bellinger, who was drafted by the New York Giants in the fourth round, seventh pick of the fourth round back in April. He's in the midst of his first NFL training camp and preseason. The Giants have played one preseason game against the Patriots about a week ago now. <clears throat> Check out uh, our interview with uh, Daniel. He talks a little bit about how the draft went and how his first training camp has gone and how the similarities between, you know, the Giants and the coaching staff there and uh, San Diego State. So that's up first. And then after that, Paul and I will talk about uh, some of the takeaways from that interview with Daniel and then uh, insights about Snapdragon Stadium. So check it out. We want to welcome back Daniel Bellinger to the podcast. How's uh, how's everything going, Daniel? Uh, it's been going good. You know, just getting used to the weather and speed things out here, but everything's been good. So, you know, last time we talked to you was right before the draft. Um, just to kind of go through that draft day one, one, one more time, you know, you were taken with a seventh pick in the fourth round on the start of day three. I'm just curious if at the end of day two, and to the start of day three, were you hearing from any teams at the top of the fourth round that they're looking to take you? And was the Giants pick a surprise? Uh, I wasn't hearing anything. Um, you know, before the draft, I talked to my agent and, you know, he gave me some good information about things can go up and down. We have no idea what where I could land, but uh, gave me some good ideas. And, you know, when I met with the Giants um, a few months before that, you know, I felt good with them and had a great meeting with them at, at dinner. So uh, I knew they could have been an option. I wasn't sure what was going to happen at the end of day two or the beginning of day three, but I was just blessed when I got that call. Yeah, for sure. You So you were the sixth tight end drafted. You know, we heard uh, Matt Ariza in an interview a few weeks ago talk about how he remembers he's the fourth specialist drafted and he's going to use that as motivation. Is that how you approach it as well, uh, looking back against those other five teams that drafted a tight end instead of you? Oh, honestly, I mean, I just want to focus on myself. You know, and I look at them being drafted, you know, uh, different teams are in different positions um, and they, they just thought different things about different guys. So I don't really look at it like that. You know, I just I just knew coming into the draft that wherever I was going to go, I was just going to focus on myself and not focus on, on who gets picked where, just focus on what I have to do to get better. You grew up in Las Vegas, uh, obviously went to college in San Diego. Now you're in New York for your professional career. Those are three of the top cities in the country. How has life in New York been for you? And uh, what part of town, you know, are you staying in? Oh, it's been awesome. You know, it's been just really blessed to, to be able to do all that and go to all these these cool places. But, uh, you know, getting to, to experience the East Coast for the first time has uh, just been a journey. You know, I feel like it's been super cool and super awesome. Um, and then right now I'm living in uh, East Rutherford, um, just by New Jersey, by the uh, stadium and the facility. So uh, real close. So I can just get up and head over and it's not a 20 minute drive like in uh, San Diego, but uh, it's been, it's been good. And, you know, I just been soaking it in and enjoying it. And uh, like I said, just get better every day. Now your number uh, at SDSU was 88, wasn't available with the giants. Um, why did you pick 45? Uh, so I didn't pick it. They, they had picked it for me. Like I, I told some other people when they were asking me about the number, I said, I was just lucky to, to have an NFL number, uh, no matter what the number was. So, uh, of course, I did 188, um, but again, I was just blessed to have a number in general. 
So you're you're going through training camp right now, start of preseason. You know, a week before start of camp, uh, we saw that you were placed on the pup list with a quad injury. Kind of freaked the Aztec Nation out a little bit. Uh, but by the time camp started, you were ready to go. Was that anything that all scared you, or was it a minor injury that you knew you were, you were good to go? Uh, it was something minor. You know, um, injuries happen every day. Um, it was something small. Um, you know, the team was just doing a great job and being very careful with it. Um, so I was just doing everything I could to get better. And luckily, it was only about a week or two, and I was off it. So how has your first NFL training camp gone? And, you know, I know NFL and college are completely different, but, you know, are there any comparabilities to, you know, like an SDSU fall camp? Uh, definitely the physicality. You know, Coach Dave points a lot of stuff out that we did in San Diego State was, like, the physicality and the toughness. And, and you know, he's he's going to get on us when he needs to get on us. But uh, another big thing that that's similar to San Diego State uh, as the team led, he wants the team guys and the leaders of the team to lead the team, uh, not just coaches being leaders of the team. Um, so I remember that from San Diego State. And other than that, it's just bringing the physicality every day to practice is uh, something that we did at San Diego. Are you, How much have you stayed in contact with some of the SDSU players who have gone on to be in their first camps as well, nine of you in total? Um, and how cool has it been that Trent Thompson has been able to be in camp with you with the Giants? Oh, man, it's been great having Trent in here because – Anytime we uh we see stuff that we saw at San Diego State, you know, we can we can joke about it and we can talk and rely on each other for, for different things. Um, but you know, we have a group chat of all the guys that, that moved on to the league and you know, we keep in touch every now and then and uh watching the games this last weekend was cool. Uh just getting to text those guys and talk to them and wish them luck and stuff. So we've been keeping in touch with each other and uh, keeping up with each other. That's great, man. Um, but you were also part of a high profile rookie class with the Giants with two top 10 picks, um, Kayvon Thibodeau and um, Evan Neal. Um, but you've turned heads with your play and, you know, being first on the depth chart early in spring camp. How has it been entering the NFL with those guys and, you know, you, you especially with Thibodeau being able to go like head to head in practice? Yeah, no, I think it's a great competition. Uh, you know, another thing that Coach Davis preaches is competition. And being able to go against a first rounder like that who had all the accolades in the world and stuff like that, you know, just it just brings it out of me, brings it out of him. Um, and we just make each other better. You know, it's, it reminds me of uh, going against Cam Thomas every day for the yeah. last four years in the San Diego State. So it just makes me better, you know, makes him better, you know, bringing that competition and then, and then lining up to uh, Evan Neal has just been surreal. Dude's huge. So <laughs> Uh, that's been that's been super cool too and you know watching uh, their technique and their footwork uh, you know makes me need to step up my technique and my footwork so just being with these guys you know seeing how they work uh, matching up to how I work and you know just getting each other better now you're you're entering the Giants with uh the same time the Giants have a brand new coaching staff as well uh Brian Dable at head coach uh you refer to him as coach Daves uh he was a prior offensive coordinator in Buffalo and then your offensive coordinator, Mike Kafka, was on the prior Kansas City staff under Andy Reid. You know, both of those offenses utilize the tight end a lot. You know, uh, Dawson Knox at Buffalo and obviously Travis Kelsey in Kansas City. Do you see a lot of similarities on how they're planning to use you and the rest of the tight ends? Absolutely. You know, uh, just just how they, we motion and stuff is similar to how we did things in college as well. But, you know, seeing how we motion and stuff and then watching clips of you know, Dawson Knox and Travis Kelsey and how they did did things that, that Kafka is trying to implement and Coach Davis is trying to implement. Um, and trying to learn how they, the technique that they used um, in over multiple games. Um, you know, it's been, it's been exciting for sure to kind of watch them and see how we're putting it into our offense now. So this past Thursday was your first preseason game in Foxborough against the Patriots, against Bill Belichick. Um, you caught a pass for five yards as your only target. You played most of the first half. You had a holding penalty. Uh, I noticed that. Uh, how, how did the feel just being out there um, for your first preseason game? Uh, I felt surreal. You know, it was really cool just getting out there, you know, in the warm-ups, just looking at all the history in that stadium has been super cool, you know, just watching games, being played there my, my whole life um, on TV, and then actually getting to play in the stadium was, was just super cool. And then walking past Belichick was, was another thing that was surreal. <laughs> he's, been coaching, he's been coaching a long time, but it was awesome. But, yeah, you know, just the biggest thing was, was getting used to the speed of it. You know, I knew coming in it was going to be faster in training camp than college, and then it was going to be faster in preseason than training camp, and that's going to be even faster once the regular season hits. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, just getting getting used to that speed and, uh, you know, just a lot of technique things that still need to be cleaned up on, but, you know, that's what I've been working on. I, I thought it was kind of – 
interesting that Andre brings up the holding penalty. Um, so building, <laughs> building, building just rapport with the QB man is huge. How, how are things going with uh, Daniel Jones and, and being able to get on the same page with him? Oh, great. You know, the, the biggest thing is that we're all learning the system. You know, it's not like they've been in this system for two, three years. You know, we're all mm-hmm. kind of getting used to the system and, you know, the quarterback has the toughest job. And then I'd say the, the tight ends next. Uh, so, you know, just trying to help him out and help myself out. Um, and he helping me as well. So, you know, just kind of getting that communication with them has been, it's been really good. And it's, it's been a learning process for the whole offense, but we're, uh, we're definitely growing. So has there been any uh, rookie orientation, old school would call it a hazing. I think it's not okay anymore, but um, any way that the <laughs> team has, has kind of introduced you to the giants and um, as a rookie on the team. Uh, I wouldn't say so much hazing, but, you know, everybody in the league, they just bring rookies up and they have to either tell a joke or sing a little bit just to get the uh, vest to laugh. But <laughs> other than that, nothing nothing else besides that. But it's just all uh, all fun when they're trying to introduce the rookies. Did you sing a song or tell a joke? Uh, I, tell, I tell a good joke. <laughs> do, do you remember? I, don't know, I, I remember it, but I don't know if it's, it's not the cleanest joke I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is... This is for the families out there. So maybe, maybe, maybe next, maybe next time. Um, yeah, next time. We we spoke to uh, Coach Esselu, um this summer. He shared stories of your work that work ethic that he would have to chase you out of the film room late at night. Where does that willingness to to grind come from? Uh, you know, it just comes from growing up. You know, my my father implemented it in me, and how my family grew up, and just generation after generation, just felt like that's the biggest thing. Is is uh. It's just our hard work and ethics through our, through our families, how I kind of adopted it. And then, you know, it was just something that has always been a dream of mine. And, you know, I think about, uh, you know, they throughout the whole process, they ask us what's our why. You know, why, why do you get up in the morning and go to these 6 a.m. workouts and stuff like that? But the biggest thing for me is just, like, I've had friends that unfortunately passed away. So, you know, I think about mm-hmm. them when I, when I have to get up and work hard because, you know, they never had the opportunity to. So that's really what I think about when, uh, when I think about the work ethic of, of the game. Yeah, that's a great answer. We we also spoke to Jordan Shackle, um, the basketball yep. player at San Diego State, and he spoke about his NBA experience and essentially that it's easier than college because you don't have to worry about going to class, doing homework. Um, <laughs> yeah, with as hard true. as you work, have you found the step into that professional ranks easier in terms of being free to just work on your craft? Definitely, yeah. You know, it's, I have now more time to study the film and watch the film study the plays which is definitely nice instead of having to focus on business classes i can focus on you know reading the defense and adjusting to a defense and and stuff like that so it's definitely been a little bit easier last question daniel for us um notice on instagram posted a great picture from behind you standing on the field stands there and and you had a caption living my dream um you've already hinted on it with with the idea that of before just you know the first preseason game but um could you just go into it a little bit more how amazing is it to reach what you've been working for and looking forward toward all these years uh, it's, it's just, like I said, a dream comes true. You know, I feel extremely blessed to be here. But for me, you know, I'm living my dream, but the dream's not accomplished yet, right? Uh, mm-hmm. For me, I want to play play this game for a long time and reach those those higher levels of the game. Uh, so for now, for me, this is my first step in the journey. But, you know, just what my caption said, I feel like I'm living the dream. And I feel like I just got to be blessed and understand that it's a journey. You know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So right. just to keep taking steps. Daniel, uh, that's going to do it for us. Uh, We definitely appreciate you uh, taking the time. I know you were just coming off the practice field, so uh, you're probably eager to get in there and then and get ready for the rest of your day. So we always appreciate you taking the time. Um, I know our listeners appreciate hearing from you still, and we look to see how your journey in the NFL goes. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Yeah. How are we going? Paul, that was our third time talking to Daniel Bellinger this year. We obviously talked to him in February before uh, the combine, the pro day. Then we talked to him right before the draft. And then now we talked to him, you know, as he's in pre- preseason training camp in, after the New York Giants. Well, how do you, how do you assess kind of where he's, where he's at and where he's been uh, so far? Well, I mean, I think the first thing is, just, I mean, we should comment on that. Um, you know, when we were, talking to him in February, you know, we are one of the main people that cover San Diego State sports. And so 
you know, we've obviously developed a relationship with Daniel and um, we covered him, you know, at state and things like that. So in, in February, in February, he was trying to get his name out. He was trying to do those things. Then that succeeded. Right. And he's still in that draft process. He's sharing with us these great stories about his grandparents or his grandfathers who were both, you know, Navy pilots he's sharing with all that. Then he gets drafted in the fourth round. And now he is looking like the starter and true to his word, because before we had started this whole thing, we said, man, we'd love to have you on three times. And he said, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, just shout out to Daniel for being, um, you know, not only just to have the same character that we've seen throughout and the fact that, you know, I was able to text him back in New York and say, and he said, yeah, just make sure you go to the Giants. And, you know, sure enough, they were able to hook us up and do that. So I think that's the first thing is that, you know, he didn't get like too big for us or something like that. Now that he's over in the big apple, you know, he remembered the people who covered him at, um, at SDSU and took that time and answered the questions I thought, I thought terrifically. You know, you wrote an article before the draft called uh, Daniel Bellinger is the best tight end in the draft. And how's that looking now? I'm just asking. How's that? It's, I mean, I, we, you know, we, we had a conversation about that, you sure. know, because sure. I wasn't sure necessarily if he was the best tight end in the draft. It was we a won't bold, know for 10 years. We won't know for 10 years. It was a move. I didn't mean that I, um, didn't think he would have a great career, but uh, there were, you know, there were a lot of good tight ends and, but he's, you know, he's, he's done everything you read about him from the coaches, from uh, the teammates, just saying some things we're not surprised about and um, getting to the top of the depth chart um, for the giants is not surprising. Uh, He's going to, obviously he's going to have to play. The giants are putting in a brand new offense. So there's going to be growing pains. The jury's still out on Daniel Jones. I don't know if he's a franchise quarterback, so he may have a new quarterback this time next year. Who knows? But I think the chance, the the he could not. I'm still bitter that the Tampa Bay Bucks didn't pick him with the first round, first pick of the fourth round. They took another tight end, <laughs> Kate Otten, who Kate. The everything I've read from Bucks camp is that Kate Otten is great, but man. Anyway, that's that's just me, the fan talking. But, you know, he, he went to a team where he got a good chance because if he went to a team that already had established tight end he, and he was, you know, second or third, maybe doesn't get on the field very much. And who knows what happens from there. So he's on a team that he's going to have a chance to play from day one for sure. OK, I agree with all that. And, you know, and I think that in saying that that he was the best tight end, I was more talking about the fact that. I don't know all I don't know all the tight ends of the draft. I admitted that in the article. But the guy who went in the second round, we got to see a bunch, McBride, because he went mm-hmm. to Colorado State. And 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 I thought that he was better than him um, because he is a complete tight end. Because and that, that was the point that I was trying to make. And I was trying to just point out how athletic Bellinger is. I think that because he is a great blocker, sometimes great blocker means that you're not athletic, right? And it's kind of a you know another way to say that but he's both. He's both. And and I think that there was a great uh, video in his first preseason game of him absolutely just destroying a defensive end and doing what we've yeah. seen him do over and over again. I mean, even I think it was uh, the, the guy from the athletic who came on and, and you interviewed and did a great article and has been really, really cool with us, Dane. Um, yeah. You know, he just talked about, you know, not really sure if he was an NFL blocker and we were like, man, what are we missing when we're seeing it? Cause we're watching it and we're going, no, I think he can, I think that's the one thing that we're sure he can do on the next level, you know? Um, and so to see that translate, I think is really good, but I did want to ask you, I did want to ask you, we haven't spoke to this man since before the draft and you're going to bring up the holding penalty. I mean, what's yeah. up with that? Man? What's I, I, I just thought, I mean, I almost wanted to interject and say, man, Daniel, he's been interviewing Brady Hope too much, man, that he's going to bring up the, the, the holding. Mean, you, you did, you did throw a comment out there about, I can't believe you brought up the holding penalty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it's, it's a fair a, question. He that's what pre- that preseason is. I don't. I don't honestly remember Bellinger getting a holding penalty last year at all. I'm sh- maybe he did, but like it, that, that's why when I was watching that preseason game and they called the penalty, they're like 45 damn bench. I was like, wow, you rarely hear heard right. a penalty called with Bellinger's name at San Diego State. See, if you had prefaced the question that way, I think it wouldn't have come off as like, you know, you didn't have that one mistake that uh, Coach Hoke was going to be concerned about. You know, I just I thought it was funny and a very fair question and a very fair point in the evaluation of how he's doing. Um, other things I think that 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 stood out to me is is 
there, there, there seem to be two kind of veins that are going on with him. On the one hand, he's talked to us like for a long time. I want to be in the NFL. That's what I want to be. I want to be in the NFL. You know, we talked to his dad, Frank, like that's what we're going for. That's what we're aiming for. You talk about, you know, all the work that they did in the off season. The goal was to get to the NFL. And so he's reflective on that and he's appreciative of that. But you can see how the dream starts to get bigger. Right. Yeah. And he says, but, you know, really, you want to be here for a long time. Like the, the goal isn't to get here. The goal is to stay. And and so I, I just think that you see that the things that have made him elite, which is that drive. Right. I mean, going back to the conversations about him and Cam Thomas waking up at five o'clock in the morning to have peanut butter sandwiches because they needed to get enough calories for the day and they couldn't eat at any other time from that to where he's at now, you kind of can see that kind of shifting, you know, and it's not about getting to the NFL. It's about being the player that he envisions. And so I thought that was like a really cool thing, because again, sometimes you want people to be appreciative of where they're at just because life is so quick and it moves so quick, you know, talking about like with kids and stuff like that, like he has just accomplished something. I mean, he has accomplished something really special to be a fourth round pick. And that's a cool thing to sit on, but also you don't also want to go grow complacent. And the fact that he can both reflect and also because stay hungry, I think is, is another really um, obvious great thing about, about his character, which, which just keeps coming across over and over with every conversation. Absolutely. There, the Giants next preseason game is on Sunday. Yeah. Um, I don't remember if it's televised or not, but um, it's just another, his next chance to, you know, prove what he can do and solidify his starting spot. Yep. And uh, I will, I, I will say great article. I thought, I thought that you, you hit it, you hit it and you captured it, you know, very well received. His dad was very appreciative of it and, and good stuff, man. Yeah. I appreciate that. What's up? Okay. So we're recording Friday night. And if you all don't know, we, we do a zoom thing, right? Cause that's how we can splice everything together. And so I am looking at Andre and Andre's got a little bit of color on him. He, um, he's, he's a little bit red. He's a little bit red because Andre has been, uh, he repped him along with Don DeMars. He, he, he was part of the media that got to go into Snapdragon Stadium and um, see, you know, get the whole stadium tour for a couple of hours. And then he uh, represented EBT at the ribbon covenant cutting ceremony, which was an exclusive event. He posted pictures of um, Marshall Falk. It was uh, emceed by Uncle Teddy. So just a really cool event to kind of say, you know, Snapdragon's open. So what we'd like to do with this next, next segment is as someone who has had the most recent look at Snapdragon Stadium, I would like to interview you. So that way the rest of us who hopefully y'all listening to this this Saturday morning, right? This is when it's coming out. And, and this afternoon, we're all going to get to experience what Andre just experienced. So I want to interview you, Andre, so you can let us know what it is that we're going to see. You ready? I'm ready. The, I will say the first thing I'm going to do after this, we're recording this, is go put aloe vera on my face. So, yeah. Just <laughs> no, so that's a better move. That's just a so move. I don't show up tomorrow and everybody's like, man, you look a little red. So... Anyway, yeah, uh, hit me, hit okay, me with uh, rapid fire. First, first question, rapid fire, no way, man. Get, you can you can go deep, whatever you want to do. Yeah. So okay. first, first question is, first question is, is the hype real? That's the Snapdragon tagline, right? The hype is real. So here's the question: Is the hype real? Absolutely. It's a gorgeous stadium. It's beautifully constructed. The um, the things we keep hearing about is are the sight lines. We, we kind of walked around pretty much every section, uh, seating section, and I tried to sit uh, pretty much every section we went to just to kind of see how it looks. And uh, yeah, there's not a bad seat in the house, for sure. I didn't go all the way to the top, but I was about 15 rows from the top, 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 and I don't think it would be much that much different. Um, the hype is real. I mean, everything, the construction, the field, I mean, we, we walked on the grass, you know, that the... the the San Diego, the homegrown grass, the, t- the tunnel, them coming out of the tunnel and passing by that Cox business lounge where people are going to be standing, sitting is going to be unreal. That, I, I mean, I, that's going to be such a cool feeling. 
for when the team comes out and they're getting hyped in that little area. It's going to be adjacent to the lounge and then running out the tunnel. So, I mean, I, that can go on and on about every little thing, but yeah, for sure. The hype is real. Okay. So, so yeah, we want you to go on, on and on. So, so <laughs> let, let's stay in that tunnel. Let's stay in that tunnel. Okay. So you're in that tunnel. There's the Cox business suite that, that, that fans are able to, to see the players come into. Um, how big of an area is that? Are we talking? The tunnel where the, the tunnel, be? like, like, is it, is, I mean, it's like a legit tunnel. How big, how big of an area are we talking? So the Cox business lounge is humongous. Mm. And then between where the lounge ends and where the, the, the hallway gets smaller to walk to the, it's it, the whole 80 people can fit in there. 80 football players dressed up um, in, in pat in pads will, will be able to fit in there before they run out onto the field. Okay. And so then, is it and so then is it is there like is it a door do they pull back a giant thing i mean how how do they get 80 players to to go through that small area so that's that's a good question i so when when we we walked into the from the other tunnel not okay. the tunnel that they're going to come in but the main tunnel where the defend the opposing teams are going to come out we and then we walked and we walked into the tunnel and i noticed that there's glass doors there's like right. six glass doors and two of them were open and we walked into those two. But I, I asked that question, but the there's tracks on the top where the glass will recline back no into way. the corner and the entire space, tunnel space will be wide open for the team to run out. Very cool. So do you end okay? So so San Diego State, they have the shield, right? And and um that shield is given by Adam Hall to one of the players who has been exceptional that week. They they have different ways of doing it on um, different years. And um, and they're, they're sitting there and, and where, where are the, where, where are they when they're going to be rocking back and forth, all the players, they get all there, they rock back and forth and then they run out. Are they doing that in the tunnel or are they doing that when they get out? Do you anticipate? Um, I would say the front of the team will be right outside that gate. Okay. So the people that are sitting across on the other side of the field, we'll be able to see that front row of the team. And then the people sitting on the, the seats right above it and to the side of it will probably be able to you know, peek in and look. But I would think it'd be right up against that, uh, that the glass, which won't be there at that time. But it'll and be I, and right I think, yeah, and I think remembering last year, the, the scrimmage in Carson, they practiced that a few times, like how they would run onto the field. And so I'm, I'm assuming that that would be something to look out for tomorrow as they're, as they're practicing that. Okay. So, um, so then you got to see that. Tell me about the locker room, right? Because when we've talked to the players, you talked to the coaches, it was, you know, we asked Brady, you know, how was it? How was the visit? Cause, oh, you know, we didn't get to see the locker room. Well, they saw the locker room. The players were just there this week as well, but tell us, man, what, what was that locker room look like? So very interesting. Something I don't think I had heard. The locker rooms are set up in in 40. So each home and visiting locker rooms are set up in 40 locker per partitions. So when you're walking out of that tunnel, when you when you're walking towards the locker room from that tunnel we were talking about, right. you walk into this little hallway, circular hallway, and on the left, there's a 40 locker room, and on the right is a 40 locker room. It's supposed to be offense and defense. Right. And in the middle area is where the, the team huddles and the coach gives its speech, whatever. Um, so it's going to be it's divided up between offense and defense, pretty much 40 and 40. Um, and then the uh, visiting is the same. They did that because of other events, the prospects of other events. Right. So when you have a soccer tournament at Snapdragon Stadium, soccer teams aren't 80 people. Right. You don't need an 80 person locker room. So in that case, you, there's a partition that would completely break off those 40 side lockers. And those would become then you can have four 40 locker locker rooms, if that makes sense. So if you have a tournament of four teams playing in one day, all four teams will have their own personal locker room um, and not have to like wait for the other team to come out and the other team to go in. So that was kind of something he mentioned that they designed specifically for non-San Diego State football events for all the other stuff that they want to host at the stadium. 
we don't want to give away too much, but why not? Easter eggs, right? So some of those Easter eggs have been coming out. I think uh, there I've seen pictures of um, Jack Murphy and his dog Abe, right? That was out there. I think I saw on social media pictures of seats from the mm-hmm. old stadium. There was four um, of them. Yeah, what do you mean? There were four seats from Qualcomm, Jack Murphy, SDCC, whatever you want to say. Four seats that were basically implanted in one of the concourses behind, um, the, I think it was behind the Saquon Pier. So you could sit on them. They, I mean, if you, but you're not, you're obviously not going to, you probably aren't going to see the game from there because it's way out by the gates. But it's a nostalgic thing that's like four seats from Qualcomm Stadium, obviously. No, absolutely. And, and that's definitely a, a thing to take the kids to, to be able to say like, look, like this is, this is what the stadium was like. Okay. So um, the other thing that, that, and again, I don't, I don't know if this is possible without the crowd. Right. But, but there's things that, that I just, I've heard and I don't understand them. And, and I'm not even, I'm, I'm, I'm so lacking understanding of what they mean that I don't even know how to follow up with it to ask what I, what I, what I'm trying. It just doesn't make sense to me. What does 60% San Diego, 40% stadium, was there any, right? That's the number, J.D. Wicker. Can you, can you do that? Can you feel that? Or Adam Millar, he said that there's going to be a Barrio Logan vibe. I mean, does, does this have a San Diego feel or is it, was it just too empty to be able to, to, to ascertain any of that? Um, it definitely has a San Diego vibe because of kind of the okay. overhang, the piers, the Saquon Pier, uh, the seating in the pier is really cool. It's got like different kinds of couch seating, um, like antique kind of type of rocking seats that you can sit on. Um, that was really interesting. Kind of the, the pier se- seating was very different than you would expect from a football stadium. Um, it's kind of like you go to like a, a pool bar, a pool deck at a beach resort. Right. Um, and th- that's the kind of vibe it has. And then, you know, as a, if you're against a rail, you see you have a great view of this, the stadium because you're behind the goalpost. But you can, it's so that the sight line is really good from there. So, yeah, the, the piers are, I think, definitely what has that vibe. And then the artwork. And I think the Tony Gwynn, uh, I forget the, what the quote was, but it was like party hard and win or something like that. OK, um, that's and then there was some paint. San Diego kind of Barry Logan vibe that that was if you if I'm thinking Barry Logan it was kind of the artwork on the wall right next to the team store that was on one side of the stadium so th- there's a lot of cool things that people are going to really like and enjoy. Okay, and then we've been hearing about we've been hearing about large concourses, right? Our homes probably have large concourses compared to the tunnel at. The Murph. You said, which one do we want to use? We want to use the Murph, right? Like they had the big outside concourse area, but like right there next to it was that tunnel, you know. Um, but obviously Petco, that that comes to mind as a place with a very wide concourse, especially, you know, back there behind home plate. I guess how does it compare to Petco? And and um it seemed like maybe it's more open than, than what you would see. Okay. okay. Well, I would say they're wider than Petco and very open. A lot of people can filter through there without feeling like you, there's like an overabundance of people. That's how mm-hmm. wide the concourses are. Yeah, I was kind of blown away by that, by how wide they were. Uh, and then, like, even if you're at the concourse, if you look over and between, like, you can see the field really well. If you're in a section that's like between seats. So okay. they designed it pretty well that way. Yeah, I would say they're wider than Petco. Okay. No, and and I think I think you know. And and it's sorry to interrupt you, but it's they're not there's nothing over over you. So like you you basically there's no at Petco you was like the next level. The right, concrete right. were under, but there there is no next level here because it's it's wide open. It's open air. Gotcha. So that's why it feels even bigger and wider because like it's open air, right? Yeah. No, absolutely. Um. So one. So the 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 big knock has been from anybody i mean you know i don't know we're people, the way the way life is it's gonna people are gonna find something to complain about is that it's too small does does it does it feel like you're you're walking into a small stadium yes okay uh it does 
It, it, it does because us going to Qualcomm and going to Petco, like obviously those have like three decks. Right. Just layers on layers of seats and, and sections. And this one doesn't feel that way. But I, that was, I think, what they intended, right? That's That yeah. was what they were going for. It didn't happen by chance or by accident or because they didn't have enough money. It was because that's what they wanted to build, not just for San Diego State football, but also potentially MLS and, and other stuff. So, okay. yeah, I, there, there's definitely going to be people out there that say, I wish this was bigger and it feels too small. Uh, but... You go in for one game, first game and there's 35,000 people screaming and singing the fight song. And you'd be like, okay, maybe, maybe this, this will work. Yeah. I, you know, and I, and I think, you know, I was, I jumped onto the John and Jim show on, on Tuesday and they asked me, you know, what are you, what are you anticipating about it? What I told them, and it, you know, it was, I didn't lie to them. So it was, it was the truth, but um, is that there's a narrative out there that like kind of television and that experience of watching a game is so much better than being at the stadium. And I really think that Snapdragon was designed to say not so fast. And so like some of the things you're describing, right? It seems like if you have a big open area where you have 35,000 people, you might not feel like you're claustrophobic like you could feel like at Petco. I mean, there's when you're walking through that concourse, you know, and I and I'm walking through there with little kids, you know, it, it they're getting bumped into. It's it's not yeah. a pleasant thing to walk through there on a and it's like, right. no, we're gonna kind of we're gonna, you know, we're gonna come at the late at at the end or something. And so it kind of seems like they're they're trying to say, no, you're gonna have a really pleasant experience because there is so much room, there's all that, and there is less people. But I just I, I I'm I'm curious about that because you know one of the things I also have looked up just research wise is that you know some of the some of the largest um, like decibel levels that they've gotten in stadium have actually come from soccer stadiums and um, it'll be super interesting to see like how loud it is how much it feels and then the last question you already mentioned the sight lines but and you talk about not they're not being a bad seat in the house. And everyone has told us that that's because they build it vertically. Does, is, does that come across as as you're as you're sitting there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Let me. Uh, one other nugget that we found out today that I don't, I had not seen or read or heard anywhere, is the student section has a rail. Each row of seats has a rail in front of the seats. And that was designed, according to J.D. Wicker, specifically for an MLS team, supporter section, because they, the supporters for MLS teams stand and they need rails to lean up against. Galaxy Stadium, Carson Stadium didn't have that. Right. Uh, I haven't been to any other MLS stadium, but I guess that was something that MLS wants and likes in their supporter section. And that's something students, when they go to the scrimmage tomorrow or to today, are going to notice that, that this rail and if they're standing they can lean up against it things like that that was something i don't have you had you heard that before you know i i, I had i heard there's a rail. Okay. The question that i the question that i i had is it's a rail and a seat yeah yep see, i i didn't know if it was just like a standing room only thing and i can i can see you know tanner um and his one of the people who run the show and 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 um different people trying to get that student section to stand up you got the rails you know make it into that into that the show as as the show as a soccer fan group you know it's kind of like a match made in heaven yeah no it's cool can't wait right on so uh thank you for listening andre you've been a great guest thank <laughs> you so much for coming on to the sdsu football podcast i'm a I'm sorry my co-host couldn't join us, but, um, you know, you'll definitely get the, uh, the brains of the outfit next time uh, when you speak with him. You are listening to the SDSU Football Podcast, presented by the East Village Times with your hosts, Andre Hagverdian and Paul Garrison.